Good evening and welcome everyone to the Cambridge Festival COG UK event in conversation with the SARS-CoV-2 variant hunters. We want first of all to thank Cambridge Festival for hosting this event and to Cambridge Infectious Diseases and Interdisciplinary Research Centre who this event is in partnership with. Also a very big thank you and a warm welcome to everybody attending this evening. We look forward to welcoming your questions at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, please do pop them into the Q&A box. Um, just um, a bit of housekeeping, this event will be recorded and will be later available to watch um, on the COG UK website and also the Cambridge Festival website. So my name is Dr. Katerina Galai and I am Associate Director of COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium or perhaps more broadly known as COG UK. I am joined today uh, by Professor Sharon Peacock. Um, Sharon is a Professor of Public Health and Microbiology at the University of Cambridge. She's also Executive Director of COG UK and a non-Executive Director of the Board of Cambridge University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. Sharon has raised around 60 million pounds in science funding, published more than 500 peer reviewed papers and has trained a generation of scientists in the UK and overseas. Sharon is also a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, fellow of the American um, Academy of Microbiology and an elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization. In 2015, Sharon has received CBE for her services to medical microbiology, and most recently, Sharon was awarded the MRC Millennium Medal 2021. Sharon, welcome. Um, with this impressive resume and a myriad of <laughs> achievements, uh, you know, in, in scientific and, and, and public health contributions, I often hear you say that COG UK is actually one of your proudest professional accomplishments, and this is what we're you know, here to, to reflect on, you know, two years on, um, as since COG has been formed, two years on, um, as, as we live through the pandemic. Um, if you just, if you just want to talk a little bit about how COG was first formed and when you first got the idea um, about uh, forming an organization like COG UK. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. Well, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and thank you to our audience for dialing in. Um, it's great that you're here and I'm looking forward to taking your questions later, should you have them. Um, so uh, going back to what you said about COG UK, there are very few opportunities in life where you can set something up scientifically that makes a really big difference in almost immediate terms to the public health of the country that you live in. And so I think myself and, and the entire COG UK consortium, of which there are around 600 people, you know, we're really proud of that uh, because when the pandemic comes along, you do want to be able to help. And it's great that we've been able to do this through sequencing the virus. Now, how did we set this up? Well, uh, it was, uh, what I would say is that this didn't happen by chance in many ways. We've been thinking about pathogen genomics for about a decade and working on it. How could we use this sequencing technology to improve public health? So it was built from deep roots. But actually uh, what it really took was the initial initiative of scientists to say, we don't have a national sequencing capability and boy, are we going to need one? Because it was a matter of when is the virus gonna change and mutate rather than if it's going to change. So we had to get that in place. So actually we've got during this, uh, this evening, a couple of slides, just two. And I'm going to ask for the first one to be put up because it's a great demonstration of uh, how we really set up COG UK. Now on the slide, right the way through the middle, you can see a timeline of March 2020. Now, that's very early on in the pandemic. And at the top of that blue line, you've got the red blocks, and that's the number of known cases of COVID-19 we had in the country, um, you know, accepting that we had limited testing capabilities then. But you can see the, uh, the volume of cases going up on the top. And on the bottom in the green, you have the number of SARS-CoV-2 genomes we had sequenced uh, in that time. So I would break this slide up into three categories, really. The first is getting, taking the initiative. And so a group of scientists uh, uh, got together by phone to say, is there, what, how can we create a sequencing network across the country um, to really track the mutations in the SARS-CoV-2 virus? How do we do that? And that dis early discussion was supported by um, Sir Patrick Valance and, and uh, Sir Chris Whitty. And so, you know, I was very encouraged to get together a group of people, around 20 scientists actually, from academia and public health at the Welcome Building. And basically we sat down and said, 
let's build a blueprint for COG UK sequencing. So the first really critical part step was initiative. Somebody just had to say, let's do this. And nobody was there to tell us what to do in many ways. We just had to get on and do it. And I think that that was a really key step. The second part was really funding. So you see at the top in the middle, um, the, the, we, we wrote a, a, an application which described what we wanted to do. We put it in the hands of, of uh, uh, um, uh, Sir Patrick and Sir Chris and just said, you know, this is going to be really important. We were asking for a considerable amount of money, about 14 uh, million pounds. And um, it was, it was to their, it, through their wisdom, they realized we needed this very uh, rapidly and they funded us very quickly. So funding was really critical and government support was very critical. And the third thing then was rapid action. So we had to set up teams to sort out the sample flow, the methods, uh, the analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But by 23rd of March, we'd already had enough data to write our first report to SAGE. And then we first began on the 1st of April, 2020. And that's when it really started to take off after that. But that's really a story of people taking the initiative to create COG UK in the first place. Thanks, Sharon. That's, that is very exciting. And I guess it really speaks to the, the network that existed, the excellence um, of, of science and the infrastructure, as, as well as obviously the willingness. So we have the willing. What about the obstacles? What, what yes. were some of the biggest obstacles in setting this up and, and how did you overcome these? Because obviously mm -hmm. COG's work has enabled vaccines and treatment and, mm -hmm. and so many lessons that it provided uh, both at home and internationally. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point to reflect on. Yes. What did we learn? Well, we did learn that, uh, that deep roots mean rapid action. So we've been thinking about this issue for 10 years. As I said, the MRC had already funded a, a sort of like a, a cloud database where we could put the genomes and analyze them. It was called CLIME. Uh, so that was really important. So I learned that what you have already that you can reach out to really can put you put to very rapid use. But I would say that there were several obstacles. The first was that actually we needed to do this at scale and we hadn't done this at scale before. So just to give you a, a, a sort of a feeling for the scale, um, in the last week um, in the UK, 70,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes have been generated in a week. If you go back to before the pandemic, across England, Public Health England were very, very good at sequencing. And in a year, they sequenced 50,000 genomes, uh, looking at things like TB and foodborne outbreaks and so on. And they were exceptional at that. So scale was, was really key because there were so many cases of, of COVID-19 in the country. I think the second thing is we didn't have a network. So samples had to flow from hundreds of NHS uh, testing labs, from the Lighthouse labs into the sequencing labs. And, and if you can think of a spider diagram, you know, it, it, was, it was really complex and we had to build that. And I think the third was data connectivity. That sounds a bit dry, but if you don't know where the samples come from, you can't connect that with the genome. And then, then you can't actually release that to public health agencies for them to be able to do their more sophisticated epidemiological analysis. So I would say scale the network and the data connectivity were three of probably quite a few obstacles that we managed to overcome. overcome. Just to shift gears a little bit, you've always been concerned not only with the science and the scientific excellence, but also with the people behind the sequence mm -hmm. genomes. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned obviously that COG UK is publicly funded and it's been very, very important to provide and really demonstrate that value for money to ensure that the public benefits from it and is taken mm -hmm. along on the journey. How did you engage with the public and what did you do to disseminate complicated findings? Mm -hmm. Well, we disseminated the findings through several mechanisms. I mean, there were the, uh, our reports went to SAGE and so that got into the heart of, of SAGE and, 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 and the government. Um, we also, our, our scientists published papers, so they released papers very rapidly. Uh, but all of our data is released into public databases. And so as soon as we sequence, it goes out to the world. We just, we just, we just release it. So that's for the scientific community. We also built websites, um, uh, including the COG-UK website, but also a genome um, looking at variants website, which anybody can look at. I think in terms of interacting with, uh, uh, with the media, that was really important because, I mean, in our society, the media sits as an interface between what scientists do and what, what the public actually uh, hear about in the papers and on the radio and TV. 
And so um, we did a lot of engagement with, for example, through the Science Media Centre and, and with journalists and so on, but also numerous podcasts. So, for example, um, I was in the Royal Institution Lectures. I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to, to uh, do that with, with, uh, with Jonathan Van Tam. And I, that was a really, really lovely way of, of talking about, about variants in a way that was actually accessible to the younger, younger generation. So there was an audience of, of young people uh, there to talk to. So there's all sorts of ways. And I would say it's certainly not just me, our whole community was active, you know. So we only did this because of our community. And, and Katarina, going back to value for money, I would say that this was tremendous value for money, what we did, because all of, nearly all of the money went on the sequence, sequencing on the science, and nearly all of the people running machines were volunteers actually so it was it was it was good value for money and and i know that many of the consortium were also doing a lot of engagement with the media and, and, and the public um, and and there are plenty of resources now on the internet youtube etc uh, to be able to dip into absolutely i think now is also a good good time to give a shout out to the CompUK comms team um, who have been always very dynamic and 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 mm -hmm. very sort of lean and mean and, and, and turn things around um, with lightning speed and also our women in call sessions that have really kind of engaged mm. with the public in a completely different way you know trying not to forget inclusion and diversity which has been a, you know has taken a hit during the pandemic for obvious reasons but but that's been an incredible initiative that, that also has come out as a result of this uh, very versatile consortium. Mm. Mm. I, I agree with you. I think that when when you're rushing headlong into a into a pandemic and into a, a state emergency, I, I think that um, that I mean I'm I'm passionate about about um, equality, diversity, and inclusion. You know, when I go into a meeting, I think you know where are the other the other women in this, in this meeting? Is there you know equal number? Of, is there diversity in the room? Actually, when uh, when when there's a, a a pandemic on, I think that um, even if you're diligent about thinking about that, those sorts of thoughts tend to slip. And it was it was a few months in when I realised, oh come on, wake up, Sharon! You, you've got to do more for uh, women scientists. And that's when we started uh, Women in Cog. We've highlighted the role of women, and you know, women have done an incredible job in the scientific uh, community. Uh, I mean, I, I could name, name name many, but there, there are people who've who've done stellar jobs in terms of the, you know the vaccine diagnostics and so on. So. But we want to call that out very much. Uh, and I think Women in Cog have been a, a way of doing that and saying women have a, a, a rightful place in the scientific community and in this response. Absolutely. And thank you so much for setting this up. I think it's, as you say, it's so easy to forget about these things and, and doing little is so much better than doing nothing at all. Um, so if we talk about Cog UK, a bit more as, as, as an organization. I think what really stands out to me is that both at home and internationally, COG has become synonymous with innovation, team science, giveaway culture. Sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 genomes has been an unprecedented collective effort, you know, mm -hmm. even recalling the numbers that you've just said, you know, we don't go mm -hmm. from zero to, to, to 70,000 a week, you know, for, for nothing. And with all four public health agencies, coming together, um, it obviously has required formal data sharing among, amongst all of the participants. Um, so I think it would be interesting to reflect a little bit about what's been the role and the impact of organization like COG UK, because you know, in many ways, it's been a project, it's been a program, it's not a, a permanent structure, but mm. it feels like it's, it had so much meaning and so much impact, both mm. in the UK and globally. Mm. Yeah, well, this is where our second and last slide comes in, I think. So if we could just pop that slide up. What this slide shows is that, uh, that sits at the very heart of our success, and that is inclusion of partners. And so, you know, the response has really been led by, you know, the public health agencies very much. And, you know, with the four public health agencies of the United Kingdom, really uh, linking up with them has been uh, very key. And... In addition to that, we had multiple academic partners uh, who had the capabilities, and it was really stitching together the public health understanding and all of the capabilities, plus the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which has got incredibly 
impressive uh, capabilities. And so the impact of the organization of COG UK was really to bring everyone together. It was like, it was, it was like glue. Uh, and uh, you know, being able to bring the four public health agencies together and share data. Um, to my knowledge, that's the first time the four public health agencies were able to share uh, that scale of genome data across different borders. And that was a, a, real, um, a real win for, for COG UK actually to be able to do that. But of course that was critical if, we, if we're tracking the pandemic across the entire United Kingdom rather than um, a, a particular country in the United Kingdom. So we, um, that was really important. And that impact I very much hope will last, that idea that we all work together. In terms of that model, there were people overseas that were, were thought that was a very good model, model and aimed to uh, sort of em emulate it. So, uh, and in terms of developing a model, many people have come to us to say, this is a fantastic model. We want to try and recapitulate it. And of course we would tell them, you know, what it consisted of and how we did it. Now it's not always suitable in every country. It depends on their circumstances, size and, and situation. But um, in terms of global, I th think the COG UK is recognized as a huge success for sequencing. Furthermore, because we shared all the data, our very early genomes were available to everybody in any country. Um, and that allowed uh, those people, even if they didn't have their own sequence data at that early point, the opportunity to see what was circulating and start to think about how they'd analyze their own genomes as they generated them. So I, I believe it had, um, an important impact in the UK and I hope a lasting impact in the way we all work together but also an impact on on um, how, how the world sees, um, sees us actually and what they could learn from us and we from them too. So basically also a great thought leadership model and a, and a, and a platform mm. and, and not simply the mechanics of, of mm. gathering all of the data pooling it and analysing which when I say this, it almost sounds so dry and, and simple, but we all know how complicated and sophisticated all of those tools and um, um, analyses have been. I'm sure the public would want to know a little bit more about mutations. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, this is this is such a hot topic. It, it kind of runs our lives. You know, it has been from from all of the lockdowns to to sort of different measures. And, you know, despite genomic sequencing and surveillance enabling scientists to track the spread of variants more effectively, provides this information to policymakers um, and helps monitor changes to, you know, the genetic code of the, of the, of the variants, it's still difficult to make concrete predictions. Um, so why would you say sequencing is still important? Uh, and do you think sequencing is important? Mm, yeah. And how does it help track mutations and I guess mm. that the, what is the so what with sequencing yeah 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 well it's it's a surprise to me even now that that uh, many people would really understand what you know mutations are and what variants are and so it's become it's become into our common language and people like me were thinking about that 10 years ago but now it's very much common language so I won't go over what mutations are in detail but you can think of them as typos in in a genome of 30,000 bases so the SARS-CoV-2 is 30,000 bases RNA uh, virus and uh, the virus can actually in introduce a mistake basically and develop a typo which can then go on to change the virus and really sequencing is just tracking those typos and comparing the typos in one virus to another to see how they evolve because they will evolve over time and the virus um, mutates around once or twice a month as it transmits from one person to another but that low rate kind of really doesn't, there are so many infection cases in the, in the world um, and we know the rate of mutation is actually higher in some people with chronic infection that that, that low rate, you, know, you can't get too complacent about that because there's clearly been a lot of mutation. So mutation from the very beginning allowed us to track the evolution of the virus and then start to predict where changes would lead to a change in biology. And it was the, it was the, characterization really I think the big wake-up call was with the alpha variant that first detected in in uh, in the south of England when there was a, an expansion of cases beyond what you might expect uh, based on what was happening elsewhere in the country and it was then really that there was a connection made between the number of cases and and the genome sequencing and that really that was the first key point where I think people really woke up to the importance of of, of variants since then, we all know that there's been wave upon wave of 
of variants of concern that have, have replaced the last one. So we've had, you know, we've had Alpha, Delta, um, Omicron, there've been other variants elsewhere. But your, your question really was, why do we need to keep doing it? Well, so, so why did we do it in the first place? The so what is because we needed to categorize the virus causing infection and say, is that particular variant more likely to cause severe disease or, or spread or evade our immune system? So it's sort of looking back, it was that was very much the so what. And that sort of was the basis on which biology was, was built around the virus. But looking ahead, what we face with now is, you know, we know that uh, the Omicron uh, BA2 is, is dominant in the UK. However, there is no reason to think that this is the last variant. And, um, and so we'll, you know, we're sequencing the same thing pretty much over and over again. But what we're looking for is something that looks um, uh, the very early signal of a new variant that could be a variant concern that we really need to track. So we cannot assume that it's all over and that the pandemic is over. It, the pandemic is not over. We've got a very large number of cases, but it's not over in terms of the variants of concern, I don't think, in my opinion. Um, so we're looking now for the signal of you know, new, new variants of concern. And you know the, our audience may want to ask about about the recombinant recombinants of viruses that two 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 SARS-CoV-2 viruses basically stuck together. Um, so that's what's under under the microscope at the moment in terms of what what impact that will have. And I believe that sequencing will be sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 is going to be necessary for all the while that it's causing clinical symptoms of infection. So by the time we get to the point where you know, it causes a mild sniffle, then no one's going to be particularly interested in the sequence data. But all the while it can potentially cause severe disease and unfortunately death, we need to keep sequencing to make sure that that's not a new variant that's going to be, you know, more lethal to people really, or, or evade their immune system, you know. Absolutely. And I guess if we think about um, the fact that, that COVID is not necessarily going to anywhere, just yet, um, you know, can we expect to live with the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a sequence in a way to sort of to, to, to support that in the in in the interim while it you know until it does become Eat it out. <laughs> a sniffles, but it could also mm -hmm. turn into something else. So, so mm -hmm. I guess I guess the question is more about what's your take on how we can expect to live with with the virus. Mm -hmm. Well. Um... We, we, there's no doubt that the virus is here to stay, so it's not going anywhere. We're going to have to live with it. And the way that we live with it um, will depend on uh, the, uh, the measures taken by you know, our governments and, and by our society. At the moment, uh, we have a very high level of, of, uh, of, of COVID-19. And one hopes that over time that, that the rates will, start, will, will, will begin to drift down. Certainly the amount of immunity that people have in the, in the population is very high, but because um, Omicron can actually get around that, that's why we're having so many cases. I have to say, Katrina, it's really difficult to predict exactly what the next few months and years are going to look like. We don't really even know how seasonal this virus is. So for example, other coronaviruses that causes cold, they are very seasonal and particular coronaviruses have particular seasonality about them. We haven't ever seen a pattern of seasonality actually across the world. We haven't seen it sort of up. up. It, there's really what's happened is the waves have come with the variants of concern rather than particular seasons. So, in terms of how we live with the virus, I think it's we're learning to live with it now in terms of tolerating a fairly high amount of disease and, and some people going into hospital. And uncertainty. Yes, and uncertainty. We're trying to live with that, but trying to forecast what that might be. I mean, I have to say that when you start to forecast, you, you're often wrong. And as a scientist, actually, what I would say is really important to recognise that we say things that that can be wrong, and we have to correct that. And you know that 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 that's the, because we're constantly learning. To say we know how we're going to live with it, I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm, I I don't have an, a good enough crystal ball to really tell you. But what I do know is that all the while we're living with a virus that causes clinical disease, as I said already. We need to sequence it to understand its genetic makeup and therefore the most likely, predicting the most likely way it's going to interact with us uh, before the virus declares itself. And for example, shows that you know, it can completely escape immunity or, or uh, transmits even faster than what's circulating at the moment. 
So it's a bit of a watch this space to tell you the truth. I mean, quite, quite frankly, I, I, I knew what the answer was going to be, but I was still secretly hoping for a slightly more positive outlook. You know, it's, it's like when you're watching the same film over and over again, but hopefully yeah. the, the main character is, is, is going to prevail. Um, I guess. But it's very, it's very positive in many ways because, you know, the positives are that we've got a, va a very effective vaccine and that prevents people from getting severe disease. You, you, uh, and that is a huge triumph. Uh, we certainly can't stop transmission uh, with the vaccine that we have. Um, but when you think about what we've all been through in the last two years, I think that where we are at the moment is generally a very positive place and feeling very optimistic. Uh, but, but the role of the scientists and the public health uh, teams are to really watch what's happening next whilst everybody attempts to go back to their kind of what what feels like the, kind of the new normal. And, and speaking of that, so obviously you explained why tracking mutations is important to understand the virus better but also to provide this evidence uh, to people to make more informed choices such as travel for instance so mm. um, and, and the same can be applied to infectious diseases in general it's, it's not just mm -hmm. uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, for example, you know, the, there are certain policy decisions that are being made, such as all travel restrictions being lifted. So, anecdotally, if you tested positive, would you still travel? I wouldn't, actually, but in the same way that I wouldn't if I had influenza. Because um, as a sort of, I suppose, trying to be a thoughtful member of the community, I wouldn't travel with an infectious disease that I know could make other people ill. And even if it didn't make the people ill that I transmitted it to, it could make people ill that they're transmitting it to. So I think as a general rule of thumb, if I have a, 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 an infection that I think could be COVID, I will test myself. And if I have, if I have COVID-19, I would try to limit the amount of spread. Um, I just think that's a civic duty, quite frankly. And um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't travel if I, if I thought I had COVID, but but you know, you, you can now go to Boots or wherever and get your test. Um, so there, there's, and, and in fact, I had a viral illness recently, which wasn't COVID, but it was another virus. I still stayed at home because I think what we've learned is that we we shouldn't have a culture where you go to work, whatever. You know, if you've got, if you've got a viral infection, then keep it to yourself as much as possible until you've recovered. recovered. We're relearning some of the basic social norms. Now, yes, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, don't it's yeah. to the surface. Mm. Mm. And I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, the future outlook and, and again, some of the um, some of the things that came out of the Pog UK. You know, we've generated this unique data set. Um, and I wonder if. What, what what can we do with it to, be, to be better prepared for future pandemics? Mm. You know, how can mm. the global collaboration and genomics training, for example, mm. better prepare yeah. us to tackle the variants and, and, and future pandemics? You know, mm. there's there's so much that has come out of it, and I think that's part of the reason why COG hasn't simply ended when the sequencing was mm. handed over to public health agencies because there was it there was so much. Um, yet, you know, still to do um, mm. and accomplish. So if you mm. can reflect just a little bit on that, I think it would be a very interesting mm. um, point to, yeah. uh, to, to go into. I, I, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, we were able to, to do a lot of sequencing in the UK and that was great for, for the UK. It, it pained me greatly that uh, other people didn't have the uh, expertise, the capabilities, the equipment, the, the funding necessarily. And, you know, we had to make a decision um, as a consortium what to do about that. Now, we could have taken a small amount of, of uh, samples from overseas and sequenced them for other people. But actually, I think there was a general sense that providing training and education to people was a way of getting uh, one part of sequencing for the world out there. So we developed something called CogTrain, which um, is developing uh, five... Um, online courses with uh, FutureLearn. It's developing very intensive um, uh, uh, one-week informatics courses where you analyze the, the, uh, the sequence data. This is all on SARS-CoV-2 uh, and also distributed classrooms. So, so we're aiming to, to um, teach uh, other people. I have to say that uh, we are a long way from being the only people doing that. 
and you know we're part of a community uh, I, there are many other people that are undertaking training including on the ground training and i would single out south africa as a place that has done a remarkable job i mean when omicron came along they were, were they uh, told told the world about that very rapidly and they're very good at that so i think education is really key the, the, the second area, I think, is that we've generated, I mean, the UK has generated more than two and a half million genomes now, and we've used it once in terms of analysis. We're using that data again. So COVID-19 has really changed the way we think about science and trying to bring data sets together from different groups that have generated. So, for example, the Office for National Statistics uh, 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 data has collected data on people, REACT which many people will have heard about, where people going into people's homes to collect information on, are you infected, do you have symptoms, et cetera. We can actually, also the human genome sequencing, so a number of people, a large number of people have even had the human genome sequence. We can bring all of this data together, and it's a very large data set to say, you know, we've, we've, we've analyzed all of these very separately. If we bring them all together, and, and that use a very large compute power to, to say, what more can we learn? Um, I'm very excited about that. So, for example, if you look at the human genomes, we know that some people are more susceptible because of their human genome. We know that some variants are associated with more severe disease than others. If you bring that together and actually analyze the two data sets, can we, we learn more about the prediction of whether somebody's going to develop severe um, COVID-19? and potentially need different types of interventions. And this is really kind of moving towards the personalized medicine where you go into hospital and you know if you have a particular uh, pathogen infecting you or a human, you know, your, your human genome, the doctors may be able to know how you're going to respond to treatments or even what treatments you're going to need. So it sounds quite futuristic and we're not there yet with this analysis, but this is where we're exploring um, some really, sort of I think cutting edge science in order to use the data all over again and that's what I think training and that kind of future looking analysis um, is is why we're still doing what we're doing actually. And how can we enable low and middle income countries to do sequencing and, 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 and be better set up you know what would be the biggest obstacles and I'm sort of thinking back to the work that you mentioned with regards to cog train um, mm. so what, what would what, what are some of these countries facing in terms of setup? Yeah, um, they, 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 they face barriers, many of them at, at different levels. I mean, there's a recent um, analysis of how many uh, countries uh, can actually do sequencing now. And uh, the WHO have recently reported a 10 year uh, sequencing strategy for pathogens that could be associated with pandemics. And, and they reported actually that around just well over over just over two thirds of countries, member states, can do sequencing now. They actually can. So I don't think we should underestimate the fact that many countries have been able to do sequencing. The ability to maintain that will come back to uh, training, uh, but also things like getting your reagents, getting those into the country, getting them that you know at an equitable price. Um, uh, and you know a whole raft of other issues that are kind of re really within country. Um, so that you know, Kateri, there isn't a single answer for how can you do it. The WHO has got a really key role there, and I'm pleased to see that 10-year sequencing strategy, which uh, shows leadership um, uh, for the whole question of how we do this, how we link the data up together, which is going to be a challenge in itself. Thank you, Sharon. I guess you've touched, touched upon this a little bit in your previous answer, but I just want to ask the question anyway. You know, what can COVID do to complete the cycle of learning? You know, having learned what we have from the past and, and the present, and how can we use that for the future? And I think that means both for yourself as, as the director of the initiative and, mm -hmm. and also, you know, what, what would you want to share the most? If, if you wanted the scientific community, both in the UK and internationally, to sort of know one key thing or several key things, you know, what, what would you like them to know? And what would you like to sort of embed and, and have that as, as legacy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The legacy, but we've already have a good legacy in that we know how to do this now. And we must ensure that we don't allow that capability to decay. 
So we need to be able to surge again if we need extra sequencing capability. So preserving, and that's the same for testing too, we need to be able to surge up and then relax back. So that ability to do that is really key. If we're thinking about applying this sequencing technology to future threats, we need to be thinking about how we develop methodology up front um, to detect emerging pathogens now. So using sequencing to look at uh, reservoirs, whether viruses are entering into the population. So if you think about the next pandemic, it, if you could use sequencing to um, sequence the virus from the first few cases that are detected and then actually lock down that area or lock down, you know, that kind of outbreak, perhaps we could prevent, prevent the next pandemic. So working on sequencing for pandemics is really important. But one other thing I would say is that we, if we're sequencing at this scale, why shouldn't we turn it to other global problems such as antimicrobial resistance? So before, uh, there was a small amount of sequencing happening for antimicrobial resistance, but this is a growing problem. Um, people call it the slow burn pandemic. I mean, it's, it's not a pandemic, but it's a, it's a growing problem. And sequencing could be part of the solution. So, um, you know, it, it, we, 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 we need to think smartly about how we can apply that sequencing technology to, to, to new problems. And I just identified two there. And just reflecting on what you said just now about sort of this ability to respond quickly to flex when needed, I think a lot mm -hmm. of it has to do with um, breaking down the silos and working truly co collaboratively across the different mm -hmm. types of organizations and institutions, sort of cutting mm -hmm. through the red tape. I know this, these are all sort of the classic things that are always identified as barriers, but I think what Cog has really demonstrated is coming together of the of the very different organizations, but all of which have got the right um, type of stakeholders, the right expertise, the right sort of leverage within, within the right audiences has been so crucial and so fundamental in get, getting this buy-in and having this joint action. So it's not really about anyone's um, kind of individual legacy and pride, it's really about this public good. And I think if anything, comp for me has 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 definitely been a symbol of, of pure public good in, in that sense. Mm. I was going to ask you actually Katrina, because you've been working in COG UK since the since the almost the outset actually. So I just I was going to ask you about your reflections and you, you talked about the kind of the collabor collaborative sense of it, but is there anything else that you would like to Say about COG UK. I think just the just the incredible amount of really really impressive people that I have met in a very short period of time. Um, that's that's been definitely the highlight, and and just the way that it felt like when we were in the thick of it. You know, it was it, it was the right group of people to sort of um, to power through with, um, and I think that kind of sp speaks both to this collaboration on a micro level you know within the team but also has been very much reflected in the wider consortium and you know consortium has got over 600 people in it it's always very difficult to kind of grasp that and, mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. think about leadership of that many people who all have got really competing priorities and they do mm -hmm. have their own absolute excellence and expertise in their areas so i think um the kind of the coming together and the leadership of, of such an amazing group that's that that's probably my my biggest reflection and also something that i've you know it, it's been great to be in the presence of that and in, in the midst of that yeah absolutely we do have a few questions from uh, from our audience um one is and i think many people would want to know that it's it's to do with with data linkage and uh, how do how do we ensure that data sampling and data linkage protects patient privacy? And I think that's very much, you know, it's important obviously to gather all of this data, but also to make sure that it's obtained appropriately, stored appropriately, and um, you know, when we're not talking about pandemic response, when it can sort of just be done because it's it's a state of emergency, how how do we ensure longevity of of that process? Mm, yeah. Uh, so, well, the data the data that we we collect. So, public health agencies are 
are um, they uh, are legally entitled to, and the NHS is legally entitled to collect information on on, on people. Um, but actually, as a consortium, we were academics, and we were we had to make ensure that any patient information was completely anonymous. And so, actually, as an investigator, I wouldn't be able to tell you whose sample anything had come from. So the, there's anonymization of uh, the patient um, and we collect information on where the sample, sample came from. We do collect a series of other bits, bits of information, but, uh, but then we, we do that so that we can actually join um, the, the sample with the genome, because if we haven't got that linkage, it, it's almost worthless data. It then gets linked um, uh, through you know, a series of, of protective firewalls into a database where uh, you know, public health agencies can access the information and that's highly protected information. They can then bring their uh, uh, patient data into that. So for me, there was always um, a really key part of us as academics not being able to identify. I wouldn't be able to identify, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, a particular patient uh, to a particular sample. So that's how it was all, it was all anonymized, uh, very much anonymized, but for us, until it got to the appropriate um, uh, authority, you could then make sense of that. So we were very much the generators. Thank you, Sharon. Another question from the audience about, um, I'll, I'll just read it verbatim. So is it, mm -hmm. Is a positive outcome possible, such as the virus adapts one way to the species with the most host, such as rats, without transmitting back to humans, which would be the worst mm. case? Yeah. Um, so the virus, j just to take that back one, one step, actually, I think that this idea that a virus um, uh, goes um, from so, so the virus started somewhere else. The virus, this virus, most likely started in a bat and then had an intermediate host and adapted to that and then jumped into humans. But actually, this virus was actually incredibly adapted to infect a huge range of animals. So if you look in the literature, all sorts of animals can actually get this. So it wasn't even particularly very highly adapted to a particular animal. It, it's in fact um, primates, cats, dogs, ferrets, all sorts of animals. So Unfortunately, um, the, the, this isn't highly adapted to a single species. Um, I think the, the, quest, the nub of the question here is that if the virus actually does jump into an animal, and this was kind of concern with mink farms in Denmark, I think that, that was in 2020. The question is whether the virus jumps into a, a mink, uh, for example, becomes even more adapted, it has mutations even more adapted to the mink, so it can really survive and prosper there and whether those changes then create greater harm for when it goes back into the human population. And that was why the mink were actually um, uh, taken out of circulation because of, because of that risk. And there's, I think the same concern is around deer in the US at the moment. So the deer population, wild deer population, actually is quite a high rate of SARS-CoV-2. So um, is, it is it possible that SARS-CoV-2 will kind of adapt its way out of existence by going into one animal and then kind of, it doesn't come back. I think it had, it's so prolific in terms of the number of species it infects. I don't, I don't think that's even a possibility. Um, another one from the audience. Are there areas of the genome where mutations are more of a concern? Mm. We're getting very technical. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, the area that we've really focused on is what's called the spike protein gene. So the spike protein is a protein that decorates the outside of the coronavirus. And that's why it's called a coronavirus because it, it's got the, it, it's the, the spike proteins. They're trimeric proteins, so they're kind of made up of three parts. And this is really important um, so it's a question of where they occur, but why, when are they important? The spike protein mutations are particularly important because that is what then attaches onto our human uh, cells, the, the, what's called the ACE2 receptor. That's how it's getting to us. So when the virus comes along, it attaches to a, 
a, a receptor on our cell, and that's how it gets in. So we're particularly watching for mutations in that spike protein. Um, and we are, are interested in that because if you change the way that the spike protein works, that could be important for our, for example, our immune recognition, because most of the antibodies we create from natural infection, actually often the vaccine, because that's directed at spike protein, is through spike protein. So if the spike protein changes, then that could lead to uh, our immune system not recognizing it and us having vaccine escape. Where do mutations occur? They can occur anywhere along the genome. As I said, there's 30,000 bases. Um, but when you look at, uh, at something like Omicron, um, which had something like 50 or so uh, mutations, actually a very large number, 30, were in the spike protein. So they were congregated there, uh, presumably because that changed the biology of the virus most. So it could be anywhere in terms of our focus of where this matters. Spike is really important. It's going to take scientists a while, I think, to really understand, though, what the mutations are in all the other parts of the virus. Um, so, and, and each mutation may or may not contribute something to the way the virus behaves. So that's work still to do. So in, in, there's a long answer. In short, it can happen anywhere. Um, but we're worried about the spike because it changes the biology of the virus and the way it interacts with us. Thank you, Shirley. I think the next one is a bit of a trick question. Um, mm. so, um, again, from the audience, I read an article on your work and you mentioned that you thought that antimicrobial resistance was only around the corner. Would mm. COVID case work be as important in a pandemic with a pathogen like that, even if there wasn't a virus that emerged with this resistance? Mm. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks for that question. I would say I've already referred to antimicrobial resistance as, as a slow burn, and it's not it's not around the corner, unfortunately, it's happening now. So, you know, in, in the UK, uh, when, uh, when you go and have an antibiotic for a urine infection or other sorts of infection, your prescriber is, is trying to weigh up actually the likely cause of that, what pathogen is and the rate of resistance in that. So this is happening uh, right now in the UK. In terms of sequencing, um, there's lots of ways that we could, we could use that. We could certainly use it to detect uh, resistance we could look at the detection of transmission of resistant strains in hospital, for example, like MRSA outbreak. Um, I, I, would I would suspect that it wouldn't be at such a huge scale, but what we're doing at the moment is really having a, a, a long, hard think about how we could use sequencing to most effectively control uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance. But this, um, as I say, this, this, is, this is not, not around the corner and sequencing is gonna be just part of the answer. Uh, to tackling it. Thank you, Sharon. The next question is about um, funding. So I wonder if I might give you a break and I can take that mm. and, and try Thank and answer you. that one. Yes. <laughs> um, so Richard's asking, is the government continuing to fund the consortium at the same amount or are you scaling down? And if so, how is this happening? Um, so I think I'm, I, I'm very proud to say that the the money that has been received two years ago is still is still going, and uh, there's been sort of no um, additional funding for for the consortium to do what we've done, sort of um, other than the the up the scaling up when 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 the transition to public health agencies was taking place. So, um, and this this kind of speaks back to Sharon's point about value for money. So the majority of the funding has been spent on sequencing. Um, and basically what is happening now is people are taking the time to do the analysis and do projects and, and, and write up very important papers, which will hopefully help continue driving the science behind it. So in a way, this is the natural scaling down of it because the sequencing is happening in the public health domain rather than um, amongst the academic institutions. Ben, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, in, in terms of the science, we will continue until March 2023, and then it will be down to us to uh, uh, to seek further science funding. Uh, whereas before, we were funded really to to generate genomes for the country. And now that public health agencies and the World Health Sanger Institute are doing that in large volumes, we uh, as academics um, uh, we we no longer need to do that. But we're still around until March 2023. We very much hope to continue to spread our expertise during that period of time and our, our impact. The next question ties in very nicely with that, um, with that last comment, Sharon. So 
Cognica is one of the leaders in sustainable sequencing, and it will be great if other countries follow suit. But is there a point of diminishing returns for sequencing volume? Mm. I guess you have touched on that a little bit as you were talking about variants of concern, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and it's it is ultimately a numbers game. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think I think there's a nuance to what that question is asking, though, and that is that you know should you. I think if I were to paraphrase this, I'd say, should you be sequencing 100% of all viruses? Should you be sequencing 10%? Should you be sequencing 5%? And any sequencing is better than no sequencing. In the UK, um, we sequence 10% of all genomes uh, or, or positive cases overall. Um, and at some points in the pandemic, when there were very low numbers of cases, it went up to 50%. Uh, I think that it is a balance between cost and benefit. And I would say that that 10% is a reasonable point, but actually that 10% can be, it depends on if you have many, many uh, millions of cases, it's difficult to achieve that. I think it's then what you do with the sequencing. So I, I do agree, Mark, that I think it, there is a point of diminishing returns for sequencing. I think a baseline of 10% of, of is a reasonable thing to go for if you can. But if you've got 10% and you can't do the other 90%, you can use that very wisely. So you can do two things really, you can target your sequencing. So the areas that you'd be particularly interested in, I think would be areas of surge where there may be a new variant of concern as be, happened in alpha. Um, there may be people who are particularly becoming very unwell and you need to make sure that's not a new variant of concern. So sequencing isolates from people admitted to hospital. Um, if, in particular, if there is, 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 is real uh, concern about increasing vaccine evasiveness, people coming into the country, people who've traveled. So you can target it. The other thing you can do is do very unbiased sequencing. So to get a kind of real picture of what's happening in the country, simply you know, do, do completely unbiased sequencing. So if you're going to divide your sequencing capability of 10%, that's how I would sequencing. But I, I think that once you get to very high numbers in a setting where basically you've got a single variant of concern, there probably is a, a point of diminishing returns for, uh, for the number of viruses you sequence. But it's that balance between the volume and detecting the next thing you're waiting for as, as quickly as possible. So there is kind of a bit of a tension there in your decision making. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you so much for all the insightful and, and, and really diverse questions in the Q and A um, box. I've got um, I've got one for you, Sharon. Um, what are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? Um, in, in, in the future, because obviously COG has taken lots of different shapes over the past two years, and mm -hmm. and you you must have a clear outlook or or some kind of outlook <laughs> into the future, um, and that's that's part one and part two. If you were to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Oh my goodness! Okay, I I would say I, I talk about the future for me and the future for for, for COG perhaps. Um, the future for me, looking ahead, I'm really excited to go and meet people again and be in the same room. It's absolutely wonderful to be in the same room, scientific meetings and things. To tell you the truth, I'm a bit tired of Zoom calls. And, um, you know, this is a wonderful Zoom call tonight, and I'm very grateful for people coming. But actually, that human contact with people is brilliant. So for me, the future is, is actually mixing with people. The future for COG, you know, what I've really, really enjoyed is seeing people uh, develop new skills and go on to new jobs so already I've seen some fantastic people working very hard getting new skills and then actually using that to develop their own career and that is going to come back to society again because as they develop themselves science will actually then benefit um, society and seeing people really thrive in their career it, it, it's not a good time of, of, for anybody and it almost feels counterintuitive to say thriving during the pandemic, but for science to thrive is the right thing. Science needs to thrive during pandemic so we can become stronger as a scientific community and be better prepared for the next pandemic. In terms of what would I do differently? Um, yes, that, but I think there's probably quite a long list to tell you the truth. Um, I, I think perhaps I might have got a cycling desk or something early in the pandemic, so I didn't end up sitting at my, my, my desk uh, for the entirety of, of, of the two years. In terms of what I would do differently about, about um, around COG, 
do you know what? I just we were far from perfect but what I would say is that 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 I wouldn't change a thing about the fact that we started when we did and we did go on a criticism for doing what we did because people didn't think it was necessary so I, I think that what would I do differently? I wouldn't do that differently at all. We, we, people, um, there was lots of sort of social media saying, why are you doing this? I wouldn't change a thing about that. So that's the, that's the flip side of what you've asked me. What, what wouldn't I change? And that is dig in and get on with it. And um, thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you this evening and sort of go down the memory lane and, and, and explore the future um, of COG and, and you personally. I would also very much like to thank our audience. Thank you for turning, tuning in and showing up. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the Cambridge Festival for making this event happen and Cambridge Infectious Diseases Interdisciplinary Research Centre. I hope you all enjoyed this session. And as mentioned at the beginning, it will be recorded and available to view at a later point on COG UK website and Cambridge Festival. And what I would say is, if there are any questions that haven't been answered, then uh, please do send them in to COG UK um, and uh, we will answer them by email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katrina. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you.